All right, guys, about two weeks ago, I got a really interesting email or actually a comment from Andrew Zimba. He says, I have a thought experiment for you, Bill. What would you put in a prepper everyday carry lockpick slash bypass kit? Low skill, high percentage stuff that can be easily uh, carried easily and get you through the zombie apocalypse, my favorite. Or more realistically, I fire on the low floor, need to get out the dead bolted and padlock roof access door scenario. I'm thinking stuff like, like a sparrow shank, a set of bump keys, an under-the-door tool, some padlock shims, and a minimal pick set, rake, hook, and a few wrenches. What else would go in to get you through 90% of the stuff with minimal training time invested? All right, guys. Well, that's what I'm really going to be focusing on. I've been thinking about this ever since uh, I got Andrew's email. And the key here, would I think, would be this is for preppers, not lock pickers, and they don't want to put a lot of time into training lockpicking. They just want the high percentage, low skill attack. That's the tool kit that you see right there in front of you. So I'm going to go through each of these tools. I'm going to very quickly demonstrate how to use it because preppers don't want to be bounced all over the internet. And at the end, I'm going to show you some tools that I specifically do not recommend because they're low percentage or expensive or just not worth carrying. And I'll explain why. Stick around and let's talk about it. All right, after two weeks, this is what I've come up with. Now, I know I'm going to catch a lot of heat for this because the lock sport community is going to look at this kit and say, hey, there's nothing there but bypasses and rakes. Where's all the, the technical hooks, man? And that's because those tools take a lot of practice in order to master them. Many, many hours of hands-on practice in order to get the feel of. These tools require no practice. You can basically pick them up with no training and start defeating locks right away. And I think that's really what preppers are after. They're not lock sporters. All right, so let's start at the beginning here, the bypass knife. This is one of my favorite tools, particularly when I'm facing Chinese locks. Um, this happens to be a Chinese lock. It does contain security pins, but it doesn't matter when we're using a bypass knife. Again, you slide the bypass knife in, and I will link to some tutorials on this to show you what's happening inside of the lock. You slide it inside the lock, you push the pins over out of your way, you can feel the tip of that knife bottom mount on the actuator, and then you just lever him to one side or the other and push that actuator, manually opening up the lock. Very, very simple to do, and it really does happen that fast. Almost all Chinese locks are not shielded, so they're susceptible to this tool. So if I see a Chinese lock, this is the first tool that I reach for. If you're interested in defeating combination locks, this looks the same as a knife, except this one is very, very thin. It's only seven thousandths of an inch in thickness, and that's because we're using it to, as a shim to feel what's going on inside of the lock. In the case of combination locks, we're feeling for what are called gates that the locking bolt falls into. So we slide it down between the wheel and the body of the lock, just like that, and then we roll the wheel until we feel that knife fall down inside of the gate. We do it for each of these wheels. When all the gates are lined up, the lock opens. That's really that easy. About 80% of combination locks have exposed gates, and you can use this tool to bypass almost all of them. In terms of not true picks, but rakes, these are very, very quick to get in without hardly any practice at all. Let me show you what we're talking about. Here's a number five master lock. This is, has exactly the same core as the most common lock in the United States, the number three master lock. So it, in effect, they're all the same. Now let's talk a little bit about tensioners. Um, in order to rake, we're going to be raking on the top where the pins are. So we want to put the tensioner down at the bottom out of our way. And that would be this guy. And we place him in there just like this. Now... Many times you can't get a bottom of the keyway tensioner down there. It just won't fit because of the warding and the, or the way the keyway is designed. It's designed not to allow one of these in it. So you have another choice, and that would be these guys, the top of the keyway. It's just to give you another option, and you slide it in the top of the keyway like so, and then you would angle your pick from the bottom. Just to give you another option, not all locks can use bottom of the keyway. Fortunately, this one does. So we're going to slide him in there like so, and I'm going to grab a rake, and I'm going to show you how easy it is to get into locks. He is locked. I'm going to, without any tension, I'm going to slide my pick in, apply a little tension, and then just basically start moving it in and out 
and that's how quick it is to beat most master locks. While I have him open, I want to show you something very quickly. It'll become important in a minute. You notice how the cutout on this shackle is half moon shape. It's rounded. And that's because this lock has ball bearings inside of it. There is another locking mechanism that if you can see the shackle and you can see that it's ball bearings, you can't use a bypass. The only way to get into these locks is to actually rotate that core just as we've done. If you can't see that shackle or if you see that it's angled, as I'll show you in a moment, is another very quick defeat mechanism we can use. All right, let's go ahead and lock this guy back up. And I'm going to show you another pick. Those were the rakes. We have another uh, pick here. This is called an L rake. It's not going to be moved in and out like we did with that previous pick. Instead, we're going to do what's called rocking because you'll notice this pick is kind of simulating a key. And that's what we're going to try to do. We're going to fool the lock into thinking that his key has been placed in the keyway. So again, no tension. I'm going to slide that pick in there. Then I apply very light tension. And then I'm going to rock this up and down until I fool the lock into thinking his key opened him up. This is called the L rake or the city rake. Very, very fast tool to get into most master locks. Another one, again, let's relock him, and I will use the same tensioner, is this guy. This is a W rake. Now you'll notice this is a little bit thicker, a little bit tougher. He has a reinforcement right here, and the angles on those peaks is much higher. So it'll be difficult to rake him in the traditional sense. He's also not going to be good for rocking since all those are the same size. So this is a different type of tack. Again, no tension. I'm going to slide him in. I'm going to play a very light tension. And now I'm going to use kinetic energy to beat those pins up past the shear line and, and allow the core to turn. And the way you do it, apply light tension and then yank that pick out very quickly. And what will happen is that those pins are going to bounce off of those very steep peaks on that, on that pick. And they bounce up above the shear line. Now, it doesn't work the first time, but it'll work sooner or later, I promise you. Because this is a purely random attack. There we go. It would work sooner or later. The point being is if you try these and none of those are working for you, you really have alternatives. So you have the rocking attack, you have the raking attack, and then you have the kinetic energy attack. One of them will get you through most of the most simple padlocks that you find in the United States. This next tool is a bypass. This is actually a miniature Slim Jim. It's a copy of the full-size Slim Jim that I think most of you have seen before. They're exact in terms of dimensions. This one's just been cut down a little bit to fit into your case a little easier. We have three tools, three tools built into this. We have two pulling tools, that one right there and this one here. The idea being you slide this into the lock above the bolt. You lower it down onto the bolt or you slide it down over the bolt like that. And then you pull it out. As you pull it out, most bolts are rounded. So the force will force that bolt back into the door. And then you, as soon as you press it into the door, the door will come open. If you have a smaller bolt, you can use a smaller cutout. Alternatively, if you're attacking a bolt that can be retracted from the outside, you can push that against the bolt, and then rather than pull it out, you can push it in and force the bolt into the door and get in. These are very, very handy to have, and they'll get you through most simple doors and through most fire doors. The next tool I think you'll find very useful will be these guys. These are padlock shims. They come as a, a set of about 20. There's three different sizes of them. They're very thin shim material and they're designed to defeat about 70% of all padlocks that you run across. Let me show you how it would work. This is a German ABUS, a very high quality lock, but fortunately most padlocks have this same weakness. Uh, when we open it up, this does contain security pins. So it would be very unlikely that any of those rakes would be able to work for us. Likewise, when you take a look at this key, we have a lot of very high cuts and low cuts, a lot of variation in bidding. So again, these tools are not going to have a heck of a lot of chance. So the padlock shims are going to offer you one more option to open up these locks. When you take a look at the cutouts, I mentioned earlier that uh, a half moon, in other words, the locks that use ball bearings, cannot be shimmed open. But if you catch a glance at the shackle and you can see the cutout looks like this angle with a flat spot on the bottom, that tells you that it's a spring-loaded locking pawl. And we will be able to defeat that. If we could find some way to get that locking pawl to come out of that groove while it was inside the lock, we could get into it. And that's exactly what these shims do. 
We're going to start when it's locked at the very top. We're going to slide him in and the tip of that shim will force that angled locking pawl out of the groove. We do it to both sides and we should be able to get an open. Let's give it a try. Okay, so we slide him closed. It is locked. What I like to do is slide it into the side of the lock or in the side of the, the uh, shackle way. Let's try that side. And I just work him in and back and forth until it becomes fully seated, just like that. Then I give it a tug. Sometimes just one is enough, but in this case, good quality lock. We're going to have to do it to both sides. So let me grab a second shim and the same thing. I'm going to put him in the side and I look and I see a slightly larger groove right there. So I slide him in there, rotate him back and forth until he is fully seated, just like that. Now I know I've overcome both of those uh, spring-loaded locking poles. All you have to do now is pull up on the shackle and you have just beat that padlock. Really, really handy tool to have. As I said, about 70% of padlocks have this locking design and you can defeat it with shims. The next tool I'd like to talk about would be this guy. There are warded locks, and warded locks, they look like those old skeleton keys. A lot of cutouts on both sides of the key, kind of weird looking like that. The only important part of those old locks, because they are, for the most part, antique, but they are very cheap and very common in, the, in North America. These are the master keys. These five different profiles will defeat almost all of those warded locks. They are designed to touch the actuators and the actuators alone, so you basically use it just like a key. You slide it into the keyway, you turn it, and you have defeated that inexpensive warded lock. So this is well worth your time to keep inside of your kit. Well, guys, there it is. The minimalist prepper kit minus, of course, the Abus lock. This is what I would recommend that a prepper keep inside of his kit. What would I not recommend? Well, let's take a look. These are some of the tools that on their surface might look really, really useful, but to a prepper, I really don't think they're worth the space that they take up inside of your prepper kit. First would be the electric pick gun or its brother, the manual snapper gun. A couple reasons for that. These do, despite uh, some of the advertising and what you see on movies, they take quite a bit of practice to become proficient at. Secondly, the electric pick gun obviously takes batteries. You're gonna have to keep a supply of those on hand. So there's some maintenance involved in this thing. It's also very, very bulky and, and heavy, so it take a lot of space inside of your backpack. I just don't think preppers would find much use for the electric pick gun or for the snapper gun. So I'm going to remove those from consideration. The next subject would be these guys. These are called jiggler keys. Now, when you look at these, you can see that they're all variations on some of the rakes that I've already shown you. These are great if you've got plenty of play room in your bag, you've got a very large budget, and you're going to be facing cars or uh, filing cabinets, but everything that these will do, the rakes that I've shown you will also do just as well. So I'm going to rule those guys out. This next one might seem like it's a good idea. This is a jackknife that contains a bunch of picks as well as a tensioning tool. So you have a single tensioning tool of one thickness, but the real downside of these guys is that you have a very limited selection of picks. Now you notice on this one, we've only got two rakes and the rest of these are a variation of some type of hook, which take a lot of practice to become proficient at. So for preppers not willing to invest a lot of training time, they'd be pretty much useless. There's also a key extractor. Again, it's useless for a prepper. So probably not the best choice. The last thing is when you get these put in place, even when you tighten it down, it doesn't have the feel of a standard pick. It's going to this is a secondary. This is a backup tool. It shouldn't be your primary tool. So if you're depending on a tool to get through a fire door because the building's on fire, I would rather have a full-sized pick designed for the job rather than a backup device like this one. So I would say this probably should not be your primary tool. The last thing I think you, we should talk about would be bump keys. Everybody loves bump keys and they work great. The problem with bump keys is that there are so many different keyways out there. Not one key will fit all of them. So if you want to be successful, you're going to have to carry all the possible profiles with you in your go bag. It's simply not worth it, guys. There are so many profiles, literally hundreds of them. Even with this pile, I still find myself frequently without the right profile. So I'd have to say I would rule out bump keys as well. All right, guys, there's everything that I would say would not apply to a prepper. 
If you like this video, you'd like to see more like it, please be sure and leave a comment. Hit that subscribe button. As always, I appreciate it. And you know, if you're interested in Prepper as a subject, I've got a greatly expanded Prepper section on Lock Lab, the tribal website. I'll put the link in the description. Please take a look. I not only talk about lock picks, but I talk about everything from weapons to solar panels to water purification. Appreciate your time, guys. Stay safe. Stay legal.